On July 6, 1415, Jan Hus was led from his prison cell into the cathedral in the center of Constance, which is a city in modern-day Germany. It'd be at the very southern tip of Germany. This is during the Council of Constance, which is in, uh, recognized by the Roman Catholic Church as an ecumenical council. Now, we have a couple of eyewitness testimonies, three in particular about what happened that day, as well as some other sources of historical knowledge. There's not a lot of written in the English language on Jan Hus. So you could read two things that I've been looking at that I'd recommend. One would be David Schaff's biography. If you've heard of Philip Schaff, David Schaff was his son. And he wrote a, it's an old, it's dated by now, but it's a, a fascinating biography. And then Thomas Fudge has written a number of books on Jan Hus. And it's, I'm going to be drawing especially from his book, The Trial of Jan Hus, which is uh, published by Oxford University Press in 2013. You can check that out as well. Some have called Fudge kind of a far right uh, Catholic because he defends somewhat the legality of Huss's trial and Huss's status as a heretic. But he still captures kind of how, how grisly and gruesome the, the execution was. And it's interesting to read in his summary so you get a sense of the vivid details because he's drawing from these eyewitness accounts. So I want to read a little bit of his summary here, and uh, this will help kind of set the scene. You can kind of imagine what this would have been like. The accused was placed on an elevated chair for all to see, and we hear judges instructing guards to force the prisoner to maintain silence. The emperor sits in some splendor. A German military governor bears the imperial mace. A Bavarian prince holds the gold crown. A Hungarian knight wields the royal sword. We read of fervent prayers and details of the defendant crying out in despair of justice. There are accusations and arguments. We read of jeers from the men whom the prisoner forgives. So the eyewitness accounts report that Huss knelt down and prayed for the forgiveness of his enemies in the context of his trial. So they're jeering at him. We listen as an archbishop mounts the pulpit and delivers a bombastic sermon against the accused, insisting that the body of sin must be eradicated without delay. This is from Romans 6, and this was part of the theology uh, that the Roman Catholic Church was utilizing to justify the execution of heretics, that the body of sin must be put to death. An old, bald auditor reads the official verdict. When the man who is about to die turns to look at the king, we are told that the embarrassed monarch blushed deeply and turned red, but never uttered a word. This is King Sigismund, who had promised Huss safe conduct to the council. So obviously he's embarrassed because he's not been able to fulfill that promise. We are brought closely into an emotionally charged scene where it, wherein the defendant is defrocked in an elaborate ceremony of degradation. So this is where for the heretic, they either put the priestly garbs on and torn off, kind of in a ceremonial act. He holds a chalice, which is taken from his hands as he is cursed and given the moniker Judas. The stole is removed, then the chasuble, then the priestly vestments are stripped away from the prisoner. As each item is removed, an appropriate curse is intoned. We find the man weeping, and there are disagreements over how best to obliterate his tonsure. And they also cut his hair unevenly to make him look as, you know, to humiliate him as much as possible. The humiliation continues as the ex-priest is forced to wear a paper mitre adorned with demons and bearing letters indicating his crime, while formal maledictions are pronounced by seven bishops over the condemned man. The mitre is the, this tall hat that he's made to wear with demons on it. Again, trying to sort of humiliate him and draw attention to uh, him as a heretic. And then I'll stop reading that from kind of those details, but basically to just cut to the chase, he's led outside past the courtyard. There's a huge roaring fire in the courtyard where his books are being burned. He's brought outside the city gates into a meadow, which is the place of execution. Uh, the eyewitness reports talk about him asking to speak to the crowd, which they allowed, and he uh, basically says to the crowd, don't believe these reports. He asks to speak to the prison guards, and he thanks them for their humanity to him, during because he'd been in jail for several months uh, leading up to this moment. 
Uh, he kneels down and lifts up his hands and prays one final time. And then his clothes are stripped off, so he's wearing nothing but his gown and his shoes. He's made to stand on a stool so that he can be seen because there's a huge crowd all around. Uh, his hands are tied behind his back and his neck is chained to the stake with a rusty chain. And then the wood is piled up to his neck. And he's given, well, actually, he's before he's given a, ch a chance to uh, recant. According to these, some of these eyewitness accounts, he says, The Lord Jesus Christ, my Redeemer, was bound with a harder chain, and I, a miserable sinner, am not afraid to bear this one, bound as I am for his name's sake. Then he's given a chance by the executioners to recant. Then he says, God is my witness that the things charged against me I have never preached. That was one of his appeals that he'd been false. So many of the charges against him, he said, were, were false. In the same truth of the gospel which I have written, taught, and preached, drawing upon the sayings and positions of the holy doctors, I am ready to die this day. And then the fire is lit, and he's, while he's um, dying, he's singing a hymn with the words over and over, Jesus, thou son of the living God, have mercy upon me, until he is killed. And then his body was... Uh, they didn't want to risk any relics being uh, treated as relics, so that his opponents smashed all of his bones with clubs, and they crushed his skull, and they burnt his heart on the end of a sharpened stick, and they burned all of his personal effects, and then they carefully gathered up his ashes and brought them to the river and scattered them in the river. Now, obviously, this is a disturbing and kind of emotionally volatile event. And I've been wrestling with kind of how to address this. Because on the one hand, I've been reading these biographies of Huss, and I deeply admire him personally. I find him to be a pretty remarkable person. Um, by the way, the worst thing for me, I was trying to use my imagination because you get so many details in these accounts. He, he was not told when his execution would be. His trial had been at the beginning of June 1415, and he'd been in jail for months before that. But between the end of his trial in early June and his execution in early July, he so he's just waiting. He doesn't know when it's going to be. Can you imagine just the anxiety? But he knew what was coming. I just cannot imagine. And I'm gripped by his life and I'm gripped by his death. I think there's a couple mistakes that we could make. One of them is I don't want to try to exploit uh, this historical episode because it is so gruesome. You know, it's easy to, to try to use it just to score points. And we want to be careful to acknowledge. I mean, first of all, most Roman Catholics today acknowledge what happened to him was wrong. Pope John Paul II in 1999 issued an apology and praised Huss for his courage. But here's the other thing is, as much as we don't want to just use this episode to kind of score a point in, in our in our contemporary uh approach to divisions within the body of Christ, it's also wrong to downplay what happened or to minimize what happened or to be unaware of what happened. You know, I, I, that's really the driving burden behind this video as I was just reflecting upon his life and what we can learn from Huss is whatever else we say, whatever else we think about this man, we should be aware of him. You know, we shouldn't... Uh, be blissfully ignorant of these, because this speaks to the historical context of the late medieval West and what was happening as the Roman Catholic Church claimed the power of the sword. And we'll talk about others like Huss in a moment. Um, and this was the context in which the Protestant Reformation was birthed. And no one can understand Protestantism until you know the context that the reformers were reacting against. Now. Let me say, uh, probably the the main source of birth, because I'm grieved. I mean, whenever people, I, I don't know, I, I identify with Huss, and I identify with the Waldensians and people like this, because I, I would say that all Christians have mis all Christian traditions have mistreated other traditions. None of us should come into these delicate conversations about historical persecution with a triumphalist spirit. Um, the reformers themselves mistreated at least several of them, uh, by means of violence, others that they regarded as th theologically in error. 
Okay, um, but my own tradition as a Baptist, I, I would argue, has been disproportionately persecuted. And so I have this kind of deep, I don't know, I, I identify with some of these heroic, courageous men who, who stood against the established church. I like to say established church rather than visible church. I'll go into that in another video sometime. But who stood against the established church. I'll talk about the Waldensians in just, more in just a moment. And so it actually, it kind of, it hurts when people downplay these things. Or, I don't know, you hear people say things like, well, it wasn't really the Catholic church that put Huss to death. It was the civil authorities. And it's like, come on, you know, uh, Sigismund had offered him safe conduct and it was the Roman Catholic authorities who intercepted that and put him in jail for long periods of time without proper food. It was the Roman Catholic authorities who put him on trial, conducted the trial at an ecumenical council. It was the archbishop himself who put the mitre on his head and then they handed him over for immediate execution by the civil authorities. It's like, I'm pretty sure that the Roman Catholic Church was involved. You know, they're not the, they're not uh, on the sidelines here. So it, uh, I just have this burden that in order to understand, we should know history and we should understand the context in which things happen. And no one will understand Protestantism if they don't see this background context. Because I hear people say all the time, well, Luther had some valid concerns, but he just went too far. You know, uh, he, he should not have um, separated. It should have been reform within the church rather than a separation from the church. Now, I think there's several reasons why that could not have occurred and why it's naive to expect that. One is that the jurisdiction of the church is one of the very issues in dispute. It's like saying, you know, you should oppose a, an unlawful CEO who grabs control of the company while still submitting to him. It's like, you know, you got to do one or the other. If you don't think he's the lawful CEO, then you can't uh, support his leadership. But the other reason why I think it's impractical and naive to think, well, Luther just went too far, um, is this, you know. Uh, there's no way to reform a system that has the power to exterminate those whom she dubs as heretics. And some people say, well, this was just kind of one, a one-off event, or, or this was rare that this was happening. But part of what has been gripping me and just been a, a burden on me is that, no, it wasn't. Um, there was a lot of persecution of separatist groups. Some of them were less orthodox, like the Albigensians. Others were thoroughly orthodox, like Huss, uh, the, those following in his wake, Jerome of Prague was had the same fate soon after him. He's one of many of the Hussites who were put to death like this. The Waldensians, I'll talk more about in just a moment. Now, we also want to be careful, though. One of the dangers here, because I realize I'm, I'm treading in kind of difficult waters here. But again, the burden behind making the effort to do this is we can't ignore this. It, it, dis, it dishonors the memory of those who have suffered if we don't ever talk about it and, and learn from it and dial it into our thinking as we search church history and consider questions of uh, ecclesiology. So, but one of the things we want to be careful though is we, we don't want to simplify the narrative. It's so tempting to use history uh, rather than sort of sit under it first, if that makes sense. It's so tempting to lionize or idealize someone such that you've got the good guys and the bad guys and things can get kind of simplified in those kinds of historical narratives. And so we want to recognize the complexity of events. You know, Luther, for example, is a very complicated person. Um, on the other hand, there's times where that appeal can go too far to where everything is mushed together so that there's really never any like good side or evil side. Do you know what I mean? Like there's times when you study history and basically your conclusion is, yeah, this was that bad. <laughs> Yeah, and that's kind of how I feel about this episode with Huss. I mean, the closer I get into the historical weeds, the more I kind of wade into it. I just find myself admiring Jan Huss tremendously. Uh, I think it's a historical, a historically plausible interpretation to basically just say he was an honorable man. He was um, a pious man. Uh, it's amazing how little he was accused of. He was a man of conscience, following his conscience with reasonable theological concerns. And I think it's historically plausible to say that his opponents were sort of scheming against him in a treacherous and hateful way. 
Uh, even even Fudge and others kind of acknowledge that. You know, there are discussions about the legality of his trial. You know, by the standards of the day, was his trial, were there enough irregularities in his trial that it did not kind of meet the bar of a, a legal trial by the standards of the day? That's a reasonable discussion, but the the basic issue behind that is, were those legal standards and norms of the day moral? And my response to that is, especially as I just, and this has kind of been weighing upon me as I wade into this and think more about these questions of church history, is quite obviously, no, it is completely contrary to the ways of Jesus Christ to ever burn someone to death. If there's ever a context in which capital punishment needs to be enacted, it should be done in a more humane way. And it certainly is not within the power of the church, as Huss himself advocated, to wield the, the, the power of the sword in that way at all. That's my perspective. Um, behind that, there's a, a, a more basic issue, and that is, well, was Huss a heretic? You know, Huss was not at his his concerns were more mild in a certain way than those of Luther and even those of Wycliffe before him. He admired Wycliffe greatly. Luther himself, after Huss, admired Huss greatly. Um, but they didn't agree on everything. Huss was pretty friendly to much of Roman Catholic theology. He believed in purgatory. He believed in a high view of Mary. He believed in the doctrine of the intercession of the saints. He believed in transubstantiation. He may have had a few quibbles, but he's basically right there with transubstantiation. There's a lot about Catholic theology. He never his main his main issues were more ecclesial, ecclesiological, so church related, and just moral. So, you know, he was against indulgences. That was a big issue that kept coming up with us. He was basically he over and over he's emphasizing uh, repentance is how you get forgiveness, not money. He's against simony and other clerical abuses. He's basically calling for godliness in the in the clergy, and he, he does. He's very strong in basically saying when the clergy abandon godliness, when they abandon piety and good doctrine, they forfeit their clerical authority. So he says that a priest who's in a state of mortal sin uh, cannot administer the sacraments effectively. So he's challenging the theory of sacerdotal power through ordination. So, and he challenges papal authority. He says, when the Pope departs from the law of Christ, he, he abdicates his authority over us. So he's, he's basically calling for godliness among the clergy. He, he opposes the, what he calls the extermination of heretics. He appeals to Augustine and says, the way you deal with heretics is by reasoning with them from the scripture and, and with argumentation, not by killing them. That's not how you do it. His words were, no heretic should be handed over by the ecclesiastical power to the civil power to be punished by physical death. That was his claim. You can read all 39 of the articles that were charged against him in his legal proceedings on in uh, Schaff's biography starting at page 133 if you're interested in that. Um, it's interesting, by the way, during those proceedings how frequently he appeals to the church fathers. He consistently is saying, I'm not trying to go against what he calls mother church. He's saying, but he keeps saying, show me by the scriptures. And as you heard him er earlier when I quoted him, by the holy doctors where I am wrong. So this is why many people see him as a kind of a proto-Protestant type figure. And as I said, Luther admires him very much. Now, um, just to conclude in this way, for people who say, because because my, my, you know, if you say, well, okay, what's the point of this video? The point of this video is basically to say, let's talk about this more. Okay, whatever interpretation you give to Jan Hus, and if you have points of pushback, you want to say, hey, you got the history wrong in this way or in that way, do so. You know, it's only good to to work at this. But I'm I'm so burdened by the historical events leading up to the Reformation, because I think unless people understand how bad things had gotten, how corrupt things were, they will not understand the indignation that stood behind the Reformers' protests. And I want to say that this was not a rare or isolated event. I'm also doing research on the Waldensians, and I'll put out a video on them sometime. Um, again, this was not a case of the Roman Catholic Church wasn't really behind it. The It was... Pope Innocent VIII, when Luther was not yet four years old in 1487, who issued a bull 
offering indulgences to all who participated in a crusade against the Waldensians, and the Waldensians were just massacred repeatedly. If you want to do a little deep dive on this, just go pause this video and Google the words 1655 massacre, or if that doesn't pull up the hits, April 1655 massacre, but be warned on the front end. It's, it's terrible. And the pictures are, are horrifying what happened to them. And the, the reason I w just feel like on the one hand, this is a tricky video to make. I, I'm not trying to make, I hope you, this is coming across in the spirit in which I intended. I'm not trying to make this video to say, a, 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 I don't know, to score points in a way that is polemically charged. That's not my heart. I view these things with sadness, and I think we all start by grieving the, the horrible sins that have committed, been committed within the church historically, and they are not confined to any one ecclesiastical tradition. All Christian traditions have sinned and contributed to the divisions and, and walls and even hostility that exists today within the body of Christ. My, my purpose, though, is this, that on the other hand, we can't ignore these things. We can't not talk about them. We've got to be aware of these historical events leading up to the Reformation that you know, caused the division to be so deep-seated and, and uh, so brutal. So um, my, my hope is that this video would motivate us to be aware of episodes like the trial and execution of Jan Hus more. I, I admire him. I expect to meet him in heaven. I admire him tremendously. I think he was a man of courage, a man of conscience, and a man who had utterly, utterly reasonable theological concerns with the prevailing church practices of the time. Let me know what you think. Let me know if you if I've missed something here. If you think so, uh, any anything that's dishonoring to us, I will delete. Everything else, I'll leave in the comments, and we can hash this out. Um, if if you liked this video, I'm putting out one video a week, sometimes two. If you like this video, a lot of my videos are on Catholic, Orthodox, Protestant dialogue. I'm also going to be doing a lot more apologetic stuff in the next few months in anticipation of a book I have coming out in October. Um, if you like this video, hit the subscribe button, hit the bell. I'd love to stay in touch. Thank you for watching this. The, t the last thing I'll say is this. The, the name of my channel is Truth Unites. That's not a slogan for me. I know that that could be understood in ways that would be contrary to my intention in terms of just being uh, too, just a nice little slogan that doesn't really mean anything. I actually do believe that that's deeply true. And I, I pray that God would heal where we are uh, divided within the body of Christ today. And I do believe that truth is, is what does that. Truth itself is what draws us together and heals those divides. So may God do that in his church today. Thank you for watching this. May God bless you.